Hi, and welcome to the Punk CX podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, speaker, and general explorer when it comes to customer and employee experience. I'm really interested in figuring out what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees. So with that in mind, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, authors and academics to uncover some clues about what it takes to build this, such an organization. Now, some of you may know the podcast as the Rare Business Podcast, but I decided to rename and rebrand the podcast recently. This is for a number of reasons. First one was to mirror the title of my book, Punk CX, which was published in June 2019. Two, because I'm a fan of punk music. And three, it's just more fun, right? If this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then hello and welcome. Please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com as I've now completed over 300 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then welcome back. And thank you. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX podcast. With me today, I have Brian Rafferty, who is the Global Director, Business Analytics and Insights at Siegel and Gale. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Adrian. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome, sir. So for the benefit of our listeners uh, that are not familiar with you and your work at Siegel and Gale, can you tell us a bit about yourself and also about the work that you do? Sure. So Siegel and Gale is a, a global brand strategy firm. Um, and but really how we define ourselves is we define ourselves as the simplicity company. Um, and so as part of that, we help brands um, deliver simpler experiences to their customers, um, you know, all the way from strategy to, to experience. Um, my role in that and my team's role, actually, because I'm lucky enough to have a number of people working with me um, is to really make sure that everything we're doing is fact-based. Um, so meaning that we have the right insights in terms of what's actually going to drive the business and uh, make sure that you know people uh, want, if you will, the, the things that we would be recommending to clients they do. Mm -hmm. um, and so as part of that, you know, we've developed a whole series of tools, lots of them quantitative that tie some of these more intangible things around brand and experience to the actual business impacts that they have. Perfect. Now, I, I mean, I'm, I've been a fan of your work for some time and I came across Siegel, uh, Siegel and Gale's work, as you mentioned, through the simplicity idea, but particularly through their website called simplicityindex.com. Uh, and that led me to learn more about your work and around this, uh, particularly around simplicity and the performance of brands that have simplicity at their heart and now you talked a little bit about that but i i wanted to if i may ask you a few questions about that and and particularly around first of all i wanted to ask you so how do you define and, and measure simplicity sure no and that's a you know that's a, a a good and hard question and it's something actually that we put a lot of thought to so the simplicity index is this study we've now been doing for um, close to 10 years, uh, and it's a huge global study. It's actually, that's one of the more fun parts of my job because it's a thought leadership piece, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something I get to, to, to really sort of have full control over because I'm not, I'm not doing it um, just to, you know, on behalf of a client. Um, and so as part of that, um, we have people uh, look at, you know, a whole set of brands. So it's, it's consumer based, it's looking at brands and, 15 categories. And actually we asked them a very simple question for brands that they're familiar with. We mm -hmm. just asked them, well, how much, how much simpler or more complex are the experiences or communications and, and um, products and services that you're seeing from this brand versus their peers? So we have people kind of self-define it in the sense that they just rate it based on how they would define simple. And then for brands that they, that they rate as particularly simple or particularly complex, we asked them why. And so that's what actually got us to how do we define simplicity as we see from how the consumer defines simplicity right. they're really you know there's some like key dimensions if you will that always come up in in the way they think about it and and some of those are so some obvious ones which is just clarity right I, it's easy to understand i know i know what they're studying me or you know i i understand where to find something 
Um, and that's potentially the more obvious one. Some of the maybe less obvious ones is there is a huge link between sort of trust and yes. honesty and simplicity. So meaning it really is also about uh, brands or, that people see as having delivered what they promised. Um, right. Surprisingly, you know, that continues not to happen. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yes. I mean, I think what, what, what fascinates me about that is that it's actually, it's quite relative and and also a moving target as well as the kind of the the market and the, so i guess the aggregate of experiences can move and so therefore exactly. it's not an absolute thing i you get there and then you're in nirvana it's a con, it's a consistent it's a constant journey towards something I guess. exactly and, and that's sort of the importance of consistency actually to to that point because yes you can be doing fantastically but then if you sort of take your eye off the ball if you will um and you know you deliver one Bad thing. Now, if you've if you've managed to build that trust over time, you'll be forgiven. Yes. Um, but you know, if if you haven't, or if you take your eye off the ball too many times, you no longer will be forgiven. And at which point, what we've seen also in in that study is that people who ex, um, who experience complexity in their interaction, they don't think it's by accident. So, right. for example, when people go to you know have a health insurance experience of claim and things are going you know difficult or things are difficult and are hard for them to resolve they don't think that's by accident they think oh well they're trying to pull one over on me you know or they're right. trying to rip me off or you know so so i think that that's the real also link because it's not just that if you're simple people trust you more so if you're if you're delivering com complex experiences people see you as doing it on purpose you're likely not doing it on purpose you're doing it because you didn't figure out you know how to you weren't maybe being customer centric enough you were probably not actually thinking from the customer standpoint and you were thinking more from a legal standpoint or anyway from an internal standpoint but but the implication of that is people don't see that as as accident yeah because it seems to me that this, as you kind of say you talk about trust plays a big import, a big role in this and it feels to me like if you have a brand that is possibly has a very quick and friction free experience but is not necessarily well known or well trusted then there's a there's there's because the trust that almost creates cognitive work or cognitive complexity in many ways of, uh, as opposed to something that's well trusted as you say, they'd be more forgiven for something which might not necessarily be as slick and as friction-free as, as, as maybe a new entrant or an untrusted or less trusted brand. Yeah, completely. And I think, you know, and we've seen that actually also even given COVID-19 and sort of, you know, when people are in moments of uncertainty, that, that plays all the more, right? It's sort of in some ways actually the the if you will sort of trusted legacy brands mm. do have a certain leg up because people you know they're seeing enough variation and have enough questions in their lives so that they're sort of trying to remove it if you will from yeah from some of the things that they want to do and and does this does your work kind of also kind of extend i mean because i'm curious about the the idea the relationship between sort of the customer's experience of a brand and also an employee's experience of a brand. I mean, do you look at it from both sides and does it apply in both ways? Yeah, completely, actually. And, and that was something that, that we did. Um, you know, we haven't done it with as much regularity as we've looked at that consumer side. But a number of years ago, we did a study that um, we call actually Simplicity at Work, which was all about the employee experience, but also sort of, you know, making a link between uh, how does that um, linked to the to the customer experience and it, it's in some ways the same thing because if an employee knows sort of what a brand stands for what the what the vision is what they're trying to deliver and understands their role in delivering that that's also when the customer experience will obviously be be better because um the employee and the employees aligned if you will to delivering what the customer is expecting to get mm -hmm. um and i do think well, at least you know I, I think that's changing a lot i mean i think a lot of people are now realizing this or at least this is becoming much more commonplace but you know back in the day it was always just like oh well let's focus on communications and anyway yeah. they, where, where the employee gets a little kind of ignored in it and people don't realize the the impact that that has yeah, I mean, I think the um, because it, it, I was remember listening to one. Uh, I was in participating in an online event a few weeks ago, and there was somebody that was speaking that said that they'd um, they remember sort of only recently kind of being visiting a number of companies and seeing how um, employees were still having to deal with sometimes between ten and 
15 different applications when they're when they're having to serve mm -hmm. their customers and there has to be i mean that 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 you know and, and i was i listened to that and i was like well i can get that 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 happens but i'm thinking oh my god is that still happening as well <laughs> and but but it has a real it acts as a real break on that and you know um an impediment to that sort of simplicity uh, you know so i guess the internal experience also feeds into the the external side of things as well yeah completely and, and actually going back to the health insurance example that's what we've seen actually even in work we've done with with some health health insurance companies is um because it's not the employee not wanting to deliver a good experience to exactly what you described. It's because their internal processes are often so Byzantine yeah. <laughs> and complex and, you know, and have, have sort of piled up over time because no one looked at it in a holistic fashion, mm -hmm. which is then actually preventing the employees from delivering, um, you know, the right experience to customers. So, so there's definitely yeah, that whole aspect to it, which is like the employees even sort of work experience and ability to, themselves have a simple way of serving the customer yeah and so i also kind of know that one of the things i i also kind of know and i and i'm i've i've quoted kind of your work in terms of um how because you've done this study over like the last say 10 years or so mm -hmm. that there's you've been able to track some of the and engage some of the, the the payoffs and benefits to brands that have been identified as having simplicity at the core of what they do i mean it, it could you share with me so what some of the payoffs and benefits kind of have yeah, been? Sure. Because some of them are quite outstanding. Yeah, no, I mean, look, one of the things that um, that even at this stage practically beggars disbelief in people when I show it to them is, is you know, we've, over time, you know, when we first started doing the study back in 2009, uh, 2009, 2010, we created a portfolio out of the publicly traded brands that just you know, were rated by consumers at the top. Mm -hmm. And and we saw they did better than the major indices. And then sort of year on year, we've basically just been sort of, you know, fake managing that portfolio, if you yes. will, and sort of, sort of trading it in and out when the results came in with the, whichever brands. Although it's not always different brands, because a lot of the brands that have been at the top have stayed at the top. But obviously, there's movement, um, but but there is also actually quite a bit of, of consistency there, because it is brands like um, Google, like Amazon, like Netflix in more recent times. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what we've seen is those brands' stock performance, um, you know, vastly outperforms uh, any index. Uh, and, you know, if I actually, you know, I'm sort of kicking myself because I should have believed my own uh, data, <laughs> if you will, and I should have actually really created this thing because actually I probably would be retired by now. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, because you know, they really, I mean, it's, it's all these brands that have actually exploded. Um, and, and a lot of it is because they did, um, uh, you know, do something, one, massively disruptive, but they actually also leveraged simplicity in the way they did that in the sense that they made something significantly easier on people. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what's actually driven their growth. So there's that benefit. And then the other big benefits we've seen is, is uh, you know, much higher likelihood to recommend. So way stronger net promoter scores for people who, mm -hmm. who track that type of data, more likely to say they would pay a premium and, and you know, spend more money uh, for brands that deliver simpler experiences to them. So, so really a lot of yeah, a lot of financial benefits to this. It doesn't mean that, you know, you simplify your experience, your stock price automatically goes up, but it's just, we are seeing a lot of strong positive correlation, if you will, between those positive yeah. metrics. I mean, you mentioned Google and, and, and Amazon. I mean, can you give us a couple of examples, maybe kind of the outside the usual suspects, as it were, I say that in kind of like mm -hmm. in an audio recording, can doing air quotes, which <laughs> is, <kind> of, <laughs> um, but could you give us a couple of examples of maybe some kind of, of brands that we might not necessarily be that familiar sure. kind of with that are identified as having simplicity at the core and what they're sort of doing to make their experiences more simple, as it were? Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, and there's some that are, um, I'll, I'll give you both some that are in there that are surprises often to people. And then I'll give you one that's not in there that's a big surprise also to people why it's not in there. Um, so, so some that surprise people is, is actually brands like Aldi or Costco in uh, right. the US. Um, and, and the reason that surprises people is they're like, God, they're, you know, that's not like some beautifully designed experience. Um, it's very bare bones. But back to that idea of, of sort of trust and you deliver on your promises, that's mm -hmm. what they do fantastically. I mean, they do two things fantastically well. One sort of, you know, 
they're promising you a deal and when you're going in there and actually the experience you're having even of that bare bones store is is telling you that we're not putting money in the store to put frills in the store we're giving you you know the savings straight yeah. to straight to you and then the other thing they do fantastically well is yes you're finding a lot of your if you will sort of common household goods or or uh, food products that you're wanting to buy but you're also having these little moments of delight mm. where you're finding things you really weren't expecting to find you know like they they put lamp tops in there at some ridiculously low price at holidays at times they um, you know things like fancier german chocolates that you suddenly find at a, at a you know very cheap price so, so they've also figured that it's not just about delivering the basics it's also about giving people those yeah little moments of joy and delight that actually i think really ties to people then feeling like they have not just a good experience but then great loyalty to, to that brand and then the converse on the sort of surprise why it's not in there is everyone always thinks like oh well yes you're that stock price performance that must be there because apples in your index uh -huh. that's actually not true so apple has never been at the top it, it's in our study but it has never been at the top and that's for two reasons sort of one big major reason why it's never been in there is that actually apple is incredibly polarizing right there's apple users love apple and thinks they think it is the simplest and it's fantastic and, and rate it highly um, but Apple non-users are kind of much stronger rejectors than they are. It's like, oh, I don't get Apple anything. You know, Apple's not for me. So, so there's a there's a much more polarizing nature to to that brand than some of those others like Google. Um, and then the the other thing that they um, well, and more recently, which they have not been doing as well on, is the proliferate even amongst those users who have been loyal, they're actually rating Apple lower these days because actually in one of the open ends we saw Apple should call itself the dongle company. Right. As, uh, you know, they, I think they have lost a bit of that focus that, you know, was famous for Steve Jobs around the idea of, you know, reduce as much as possible, don't do anything extraneous, you know, really get it to that sort of perfect mm -hmm. level of experience. And so, and then thirdly, I think they get hard, given that they promise simplicity, I think they also get judged even more harshly on it if they don't deliver it. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating because I'm a, I'm an, um, I remember a number of years ago, I switched from PC to Mac. And I guess it is very much in that, are you PC, are you Mac sort of mm -hmm. thing? Or if, you, if you're if you PC and then you go Mac, then you never go back sort of thing. <laughs> and it's, um, but I do get the idea around kind of the dongle company because it's like they're forever changing kind of ports and leads and everything else. And if yeah, you, and not uh, seeming, it, for, not for you, right? It sort of feels like they're doing it for themselves and not to your benefit. Yeah, no, so I have this proliferation of kind of, um, redundant kind of peripherals, mm -hmm. which I'm going like, I have no idea. I mean, just junk them all. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, no, it's fascinating. But I also kind of know that, um, so that's, I mean, that's really interesting because I think that with, it's very easy to equate sort of clean lines and simple design and all that type of stuff with kind of like, like look and feel as it were with mm -hmm. simplicity, but actually it's, it's much, much more complicated than that. Right. Yeah, and, and it is much more around that sort of that sort of core of are you promising something and really delivering on it and delivering it on and delivering on it in a way that people as see as as true and 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 described to you and, and ideally differentiated, right? I mean, in the sense that you're actually managing to deliver something that others aren't. Yeah, absolutely. But what I also could notice is that the last update to the world's simplest brands on the simplicity index was was back in uh, yes. 2018 and i was i looked no, at sadly. it recently and i was like no <laughs> no no agreed well look sadly look we were supposed to do it at the start of this year actually we were all geared up to to go into field and then covid happened um and and then uh you know for a variety of reasons i mean including being financially prudent because it's actually very expensive stuff. well yeah so um, we we sort of decided to pull out i'm sort of regretting i mean we decided to 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 wait for sort of both for that but also for the notion that there was so much because uh, frankly it really was it was in april that we were going to launch mm. and and we were it just everything was so unstable anyway we didn't know if this was gonna make sense i'm sort of regretting we didn't in the end because i think it would actually be really interesting to see if brands like Uber and anyway, some of these brands that were obviously affected business-wise, yes, by the uh, you know by the pandemic, if they would have been affected in that same way, simplicity-wise or not, you know, yeah. I mean, in the sense that it, it it might not be right. It's not like just because people didn't want to get in an Uber 
or were not getting an Ubers because they weren't traveling any longer, that doesn't mean they saw Uber as less simple potentially. So anyway, I'm, I'm sort of sad that we haven't yet done it, but our plan is to, our plan is to do it soon because we, yeah, we realize we're sitting now on some data that's getting dated. Yeah, no, I, I also kind of know that the, the I was speaking to um, sort of Olaf Scheibergson from um, Fjord or Accenture Interactive the other day, and, and they were talking about, um, they come up with their own sort of trends reports, and the, you know, he's talking about this idea while they kind of, the effects of the pandemic will recede over time. Um, the level of disruption, whether it's industrial, technol technological, or economic, will are here are with a, are here to stay, as it were. Mm -hmm. And the pace of disruption is it's almost taking this big leap forward, and it's not going to necessarily slow down any uh, any time soon either. Um, and it's that that'd be a fascinating kind of thing to see how that simplicity sort of thing kind of plays into into that. So mm -hmm. that, yeah, I look forward to the study when it comes out. So, but the um, the other thing I wanted to kind of um, thing because in the in the in the midst of all that, not doing the, the big simplicity kind of study, mm -hmm. you also study in, in June. You published a study about the sort of themes and lessons that have been emerging from CMOs that on navigating this COVID situation, and what you've been finding. And I some of the theme I looked at it. Some of the themes that came out of that were really interesting. So I mean, perhaps you could tell me about the study and 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 some of the highlight some of the themes that you think are that are emerging and what's the kind of the most important lessons we should be taking uh, from that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and and actually, um, so the reason we did that study was, per as I was describing, you know, we were we we're all geared up to do the big sort of consumer simplicity index, and then we realized, okay, COVID nineteen is happening. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what's what's the impact of that? And then we were lucky enough. I mean, just in um, in our network to you know know a lot a lot of these global CMOs, and they were kind enough to to agree to speak with us. And so we thought it would actually be really the goal of the study was actually sort of to be a kind of oral history of what has been happening, you know, from yeah. a kind of marketing lens in some ways. Um, and uh, and just to to sort of collect yeah you know, you know how how people had had reacted to it what had happened you know what they saw as as the the sort of big themes and and what we saw um, I mean what I actually said because I had the benefit of actually doing these interviews the the thing that was most really common to all and was actually really in some ways heartwarming however maybe sort of trite that can sound but it was was that everybody it, it, there was a human moment people seemed to actually you know this was done right at the time when it was still yeah. very much cresting in the US and and everyone was um was very open I mean they were, they were sort of great conversations and and what really came forth is that all businesses at that time all of these everybody had reacted or had realized a, a sort of common humanity to right something. You know, and and I think back to bring that back to experience, and you know, some of your focus, I, I think that will have a lasting impact. You mm -hmm. know, because I think everybody sort of realized, look, we're people, we're serving people, we're people, we're all in it together, we're all in this you know terrible situation together. Um, so I think it it narrowed the empathy gap, if you will, that I think that often is between businesses and and their customers and just, yeah. you know, humanity at large. So I think that was a positive. Um, I think the other thing to your point on sort of disruption and all of that, um, I, I think people sort of, you know, they had to pivot incredibly quickly, like the CMO from, from CVS, Norm Degree was saying, well, we had to like pull all of our marketing that was trying to drive people to the store because we didn't want to drive people to the store any longer. Yes. And, and you know, put that all into, you know, the, the pickup, the other pickup and, and uh, you know, minute clinic for anybody who needed testing or, or was going to, to uh, need care. So th they had to go really quickly, change a lot of things really quickly, um, do things in a way that, again, in the way they were doing, having sort of maybe previous decision-making that was potentially more consensus-driven, more sort of top-down or hierarchical, or, or you know, they, that sort of all a bit went out the window and everybody was sort of doing their best in the moment and, and actually doing really well. So I think that's, from a long-term standpoint, I think that's the other thing that businesses Sort of, I think have learned from this is that they can all be much nimbler and and agile and and fast mm. in, in actually doing things. Um, and then you know the other thing that we saw in the study, and which actually Margaret Malloy, a, a, a 
I see him over sort of when I was telling her about it, oh, this sounds very self-promotional. And I'm like, well, look, I didn't say it, Lee said it, <laughs> which, was, which was that, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people actually said simplicity is going to matter all the more, you know, because that's the whole thing. I mean, and for a number of reasons, right, there was already this whole idea of like, are you essential? Yes. You know, and, and there's essential businesses and then there are businesses that are not essential They have to sort of figure out, okay, what is my role if I'm not essential? Um, and, and then there is also the, the fact that since, uh, you know, per, per so everyone going away from events and in person and all that sort of stuff, everything, you know, suddenly everything pours into digital and it's, <laughs> you know, there's already quite a lot happening in digital marketing before that. And, and then people realize, well, look, if I'm, if I'm trying to talk to somebody or reach someone, I'm going to need to be pretty clear and crisp and simple in how I'm getting through because there's a lot of noise out there right now. Sure. So, so I think, you know, that's a, that's another thing I think people did, did take from that. And, and so that was, I mean, so that came out in June. So I imagine the work was done. So end of April, beginning of May or through kind of Correct. May yeah. time. We're now in November and I'm thinking, Crumbs, that's like what five months on, um, yeah, and I'm no, like going. We know how we know how kind of quickly the world's changing right now. I'm just trying to think. Well, has do what are you seeing now? I mean, are these things kind of like still holding, or are there other things emerging, or what are you hearing, Brian? Yeah, sure. I mean, and, and we, you know, we didn't actually part of part of our goal, which we haven't yet done, was to do this more longitudinally because obviously we were doing it, you know, in the, the in the moments of crisis, if you will, and yes. We to exactly what you're saying it would actually be interesting to sort of know okay let's see six months down the line how, how things have, have settled or not settled but i think what we are seeing or at least i can say you know and seeing with with clients is um and, and even when we were having those conversations they because we did have them over a sort of period of if you will uh, a month as you were outlining sort of going into into may yeah and, and the later conversations were were slightly different than the first ones in the sense that people did start quite quickly going towards, okay, you know, I had to do all these pivots. I now have to go back to kind of managing things. You know, this is the, the pivot is sort of done, or at least, you know, the, the super hard pivots are done. Now I have to sort of think more medium, longer term and, and go back to thinking about how I'm managing things. So, and I think that's where we are today, right? I mean, there's still, you know, whether it's in the US with the, the political situation, but and then continued on the, the second surges or other surges of, of COVID, um, there's still massive amounts of uncertainty there. But I think people have now kind of settled into this notion of we, I, I need to operate in the uncertainty. Yes. And, um, and, and that's going to be how it's going to be going forward. And I think the thing that probably weighs on people, I mean, I know it even actually weighs on me, is it's just the constant uncertainty in the back of your head sort mm -hmm. of does does wear on you. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. There is a kind of, um, uh, you know, initially it was uh, uncertainty and people defaulted to, you know, safety and security, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but the uncertainty when safety and security sort of seems to be under control or as, as under control as it can be, then the uncertainty kind of beyond that sort of like about, as you say, politics or economics or kind of whatever, um, it, yeah, it has been quite wearing. I find myself about two, three weeks ago having a bit of a, a dip, not necessarily in my kind of like outlook, but just in my energy, mm -hmm. and just feeling a bit like Phew, crumbs. This is getting a little bit of a... Um, a grind in many ways, right, like right. A, we're, we're not, the, not able to different, <laughs> not able to differentiate between a Saturday and a Tuesday was quite alarming. <laughs> right. um, but now, I, was, so I think that was just it was like an ebb, as it were, and now I'm back. And so, like, well, well, it's just it's just got to. It's almost adjusting to the the race in many mm -hmm. ways. You're like going, ah, oh, this is going to be a bit longer than we thought. Right, okay, right. Well, let's pace ourselves. Yeah, yeah. No, and to your example, I think that's the other thing that, that you know, I think it's ha it happens to everybody, but it happens also, obviously, to people at different times in terms of when they're having those ebbs and, and flows. But it's exactly as you're saying, I think it's sort of, it's this realization, God, we're still in this long distance race, and I, I still really don't quite know where the finish line is, or if there even is going to be a finish line sometime. Yes, well, indeed, indeed. It's, it, and it's, so I think that's kind of, it's kind of, um, kind of fascinating. But I mean, 
before I kind of like you know, switch it up a little bit, Brian, mm-hmm. and ask you to, I don't know, this is a bit of a hostage to fortune, really, but ask you to peer into the future. Is there anything else about this, that, that sort of study or the simplicity work that you want to kind of add before I ask you to, to look forward? Um, no, I mean, just, just in terms of the future, I mean, I do, you know, just in terms of my even personal story, you know, that that is actually why I joined Siegel and Girl because I was a real believer in that concept. Um, and, uh, and, and I do think, you know, I think sometimes people are challenged by it because even to your first question is like, well, how do you define simplicity? Because it seems like a, a, a hard thing, even though it's per its, per its word, it's simple. It, it, it has many facets to it. Um, and um, and it, it, it in some ways isn't as simple as it maybe appears, but I do think that it has an ongoing sort of evergreen value that only grows more important in times of uncertainty I also think technology, everything that, you know, the pace of change that just mm-hmm. keeps accelerating, mm-hmm. I, I think it's something that anyway, it, it will always actually be something that people have to think about is also actually very important. I, I'm aware sort of with having an, a, an older mother that, you know, older people are having an even harder time dealing with with things and, and need things to be actually simplified for them. So I, I think yeah. that, you know, there are many opportunities, I guess, still for that. And do you think that's kind of one of the kind of key challenges going kind of going forward is trying to almost like translate simplicity and into our sort of service and experience? I mean, because you know, as populations get older, which they're naturally doing as you know, as healthcare, well, it's just as as people live for live longer because you know, better mm-hmm. standards of living and better healthcare and things, and therefore you end up with um, larger. Uh, populations of uh, or customer groups rather that, that that need to be kind of like uh, served I mean that can makes it things more complex for organizations that are that are serving kind of broad markets yeah completely because then then back to you know the, the fact that they should be customer centric because in some way that's you know that's the way to even get to any form of simplicity is you have to sort of be thinking customer first and not yeah. what am I trying to do first um, but then, you know, to everything you're describing, customer, you know, a, a 30 year old customer is not going to be looking or finding the same thing automatically as simple as a 70 year old customer. Um, yeah. And, um, and I think that's where even for technology, you know, younger people, technology is a huge simplifier typically, and they, you know, they're easy adopters typically of, of a lot of technology solutions, older people, um, you know, have a really hard time often with that. So. Mm. Fascinating. So here's the big question, kind of Brian. Um, so we all know that, I mean, this, this is a big topic, this idea of making the complex kind of more simple or making the everything kind of more simple, but also that can be relative and it's, a, it's an ever-changing kind of picture. Mm-hmm. I mean, so for somebody listening to this or reading the highlights and they want to improve the service or experience they deliver to their customers, I mean, what should be, what would be your best advice? I mean, where should they start? Sure. I mean, they have to start by what we were just discussing. I mean, with a deep understanding of, of their customer and what right. their customer is, is, you know, trying to do, wanting to do, and, and not just wanting to do, but how they're wanting to feel about it. Right. You know? and, and I think, for example, that's, the, that's where insurance health and even all general forms of insurance kind of lost the plot because what customers want from insurance is peace of mind. Mm -hmm. And typically the experience is not giving them peace of mind. The experience is usually creating, you know, added, added questions. So, um, so I think, yeah, it's having a really deep understanding of that. And then it's also having a realization that um, whatever category you're in, um, you know, whether it's insurance or whether you're in technology or whether you're, you know, a grocery store, um, the consumer is not looking at you in isolation in your category. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they're thinking that their world is is in some ways much more seamless than any business's world is because they sort of see it as, as as one thing and they judge. You know, if they have a great experience on Amazon, but then they go onto another website that's not trying to sell them what Amazon is, but is you know, let's say trying to sell them car insurance or anyway, whatever that would be they're not suddenly going to shift gears and go, oh, okay, now I'm trying to buy car insurance. This is now going to have to be way more complicated than <laughs> what no. was on Amazon, you know? So, so I think there's that. I mean, I think people really also, or, or, you know, organizations need to sort of think beyond their category and realize that people 
really look at things much more broadly than that and the way they judge experiences. Mm -hmm. And I can have an additional question I have um, around that as well is, is it'd be interesting to get your view about um, the, you know, this, you know, the, the proliferation of channels that which on which we can either communicate with or serve our kind of customers and this kind of omni-channel, you know, digital omni-channel type of experience. And the, that seems to be run counter to an idea of simplicity. I kind of to keep adding kind of channels, um, and I want to just get your your quick view on that because it. I mean, and how does that play? Maybe that gets kind of more complicated because of the trust dynamic. Um, but I just wanted to get your view on that because it just it feels almost like yeah counter to it. So yeah. I, I adding more kind of feels like adding more complexity. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think in some ways it depends on how well or not the omni-channel, if you will, kind of ecosystem of a given brand or company is being managed. You know, if if it's being really well coordinated and again done in a way that's like we're using all of this in order to reach the customer in the way they want and and giving it to them in a sort of way that no matter which way they want to interact with us, mm -hmm. we're managing to, you know, have them get that same feeling or and, and solve things for them in that same way. I think then it then it's fine because in some ways the the omni part becomes kind of invisible to the customer, right? Because it's just like, oh, the channel I want when I want it. Right. Um, I, I think the, but I think it's often not done that way. Yes. <laughs> you know, where it's often done more as a sort of push type thing. Yes. At which point then everything is just pushed down even more pipes. Um, and then at which point then customers can be looking at it as either disingenuous or sort of overly, if you will, kind of promotional or can sort of look at it as disconnected. Yes. Um, so, so I think, yeah, that's the, that's the challenge. And obviously, as, yeah, as, as you know, it's, it's, it is obviously hard to really coordinate things, especially when people are sort of adding adding to them as well as wanting to be innovative and you know try different things so. yeah yeah i mean i think it's, it is that sort of thing is like if you kind of add things only add things if they're all connected um is i guess seems to be the minimum standard because if they're not that's pr that that automatically will add complexity but if if actually you add things and, and they're all connected and they all complement each other and they're all well resourced then actually it can be it can deliver more connected and seamless uh, exactly, contiguous yeah. kind of experience and then that yeah. in of itself is the simple the simple the simple thing that people reflect on exactly yeah i mean it's the same thing actually you know one of because back to sort of when you were saying what what should people do often where people don't also look is like if if they have let's say a broad portfolio of products or services uh, is like how are you helping people figure out what you're where to find <laughs> what you want to sell them you know yes and and, and that's often actually again it, it links to the channel but it's slightly different yeah. issue where sort of people just put it all out there either based on you know their org chart or you know however they've bucketed it but they actually don't think about well how am i trying to what am i trying to tell people and how when they're trying to find something from me and how am i making it as easy as possible yeah and that could be as like a manifest as easy as like if you take something like an amazon um example they would say like say you were buying some i don't know brackets for shelving that you're going to mm -hmm. put up at home or something they, they also have this suggestion engine which says people who bought this also bought these things too, which like mm -hmm. might be screws or kind of like whatever it might be to kind of to fix it if they, they don't come with those sort of things. So you make that whole the experience. It's a bit connected sort of thing rather than going, oh, I need to buy these and now I need to go search for these. Right. So it's almost like going, let's make this kind of almost like get to the end and not almost help people kind of do the jobs that they want to do as quickly and as easily as possible as it were. Right. No, and Amazon is just such a fantastic example, if you think about it, because I mean, the amount of stuff that yeah. they are offering to you, right, and is, is, is in some ways mind boggling. Yet, in the end, no one, or at least I'll speak personally, because, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't speak for everybody. But I mean, yeah, I, I go on Amazon, I never feel like, oh, I'm going to have a hard time finding no. what I'm looking for here, you know, and, and that is because their whole like search recommendation, all these, all these sort of invisible engines are incredibly well designed in order to serve you up what you're what you are actually looking for perfect so brian um i have got um thank you for all that i've got a couple of final questions that i'd uh like to ask just to round off the the interview and they are based on 
I guess, my own piece of longitudinal research <laughs> around, uh, or is it longitudinal? Maybe not. But it's like, or let's call it panel research. There's another word for it. Because I'm asking lots of different people kind of two questions, which are more like word and brand association questions. And it's based around this idea um, that is central to the, the, the book that I wrote last year, which is called Punk CX. And the first question I've been asking people is, what one or two words you would use to describe a more punk approach to customer experience? Um, sure, well, I'll give you two. So, so I'll give you one, you know, do it yourself, because I think that's how I think of you know, punk and, and coming from, from punk music and being a big fan of punk music, and that, that that's part of, of what punk was compared to, um, to other music beforehand, and especially mm -hmm. compared to, in some way, some of the bloated music in the 70s, um, that it was something that enabled anyone to think, okay, I can pick up an instrument or anyway, yeah. I, can, I can form a band. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The other one I would say is tension. Right. Um, and, and I think there's tension in the idea of punk with CX, um, just because CX, you know, being the idea of sort of serving the customer, punk also kind of have a sense of kind of independence and yes. i do it i do it my way or a famous uh, <laughs> yeah well sure <laughs> yeah but, i think it was uh, a sid and nancy rendition of that right? <laughs> exactly um so so i think there's tension you know and and tension in a in a good way though, yes because i think it's it's tension in and and in the same way that actually that's what was good about punk is it's a sort of tension between the new and the status quo yeah perfect and Second question is, what company or brand do you think would epitomize that sort of like, or a punk kind of ethos towards kind of like experience? Sure, I, I, and you know, per that tension, I, I've, I, I've, because um, knowing that this was, um, you know, where, where um, your thinking was, I, I, I thought about it quite a bit, and, I, and it's a hard question to answer, I found, just because it's a, because to that thing, to that tension, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of think who's really done something like that. But I do think, you know, the one that came to me is, is Warby Parker, which is um, a uh, eyewear company. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, what they really did is they completely sort of revolutionized, well, one, you know, they, they give you sort of cheaper frames than mm -hmm. most sort of known competitors, but they completely re revolutionized the way you can actually buy glasses. So you can have them shipped to you so you try them on and you know keep the one you like send the ones back that you don't um you know they have a, a thing on their website where you can sort of upload your face mm -hmm. <laughs> and sort of see how you'd potentially look like with these things even before you do that so a lot of what they've done is is sort of put what used to be something that was if you will in the in the hands of the store or the people at the store into the hands of the customers to do it themselves yes um, and and so and in that they've kind of really disrupted the model of how how you can buy glasses or how you sell glasses um that doesn't mean that they walked away from stores they still have stores and interestingly their stores are sort of more like um you know sort of more like apple showrooms if you yes. will rather than than sort of the traditional eyeglass store and and so again even in the store experience they kind of thought about it in a completely different way of saying okay well if we're going to have a, a physical presence we're not trying to just put as many uh, glasses under you know a cabinet so that people can appear at them we're really going to then sort of showcase the thing in this in this much more kind of airy library or or you know old school uh um bookstore feeling type of way um, yes uh, which anyway I, I thought was also disruptive and, and you know where i hesitated to to tell you that brand is just that they also those seem kind of hipster preppy so they don't seem <laughs> <laughs> which is anathema to punk in many in many respects sort of what, but... sort of what punk hated, you know so 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 in the style they're definitely not punk no but in the thinking and their approach yeah. i think they probably yeah. are yeah. Brian, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for um, sharing your time and your insights and your experience with us today. I, as I say, I've been a fan of the work that Siegel and Gale have done with the, the Simplicity Index, et cetera, for, for years now. And so it's been an absolute delight to, to, to meet somebody from Siegel and Gale and to talk to yourself today about the work that you do. And that's been awesome. So thank you very much. I know, well, really, thank you for having me. And, and yes, it was a really fun conversation. So I'm happy you invited me.
Well, that was cool. I hope you enjoyed it. I did, and I always do actually, because I always learn something new when I speak to some of these amazing kind of people. And it's always something new that I can incorporate into my writing, speaking workshops, and other sort of advisory work that I do. Now, if you're interested in learning about any of that sort of stuff, then you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswinsco.com. One final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do tune in again soon. All the very best. Cheers. Bye.